really, you know, because talking about palm oil, we're talking about really some of the roots of empire and how this colonial project, the imperialist project of the United Kingdom uh, in, into West Africa, how that ties into the how modern capitalism emerged, you know, like the, it set the stage for that. Um, so if you could talk about just give us a, a bit of a brief history lesson of how <laughs> palm oil was introduced into the global. I think it's instructive sure. because it really does tie into the kind of matrix of exploitation uh, mm-hmm. of, of global capitalism um, and particularly the Edo kingdom. Because I, for me personally, I didn't really know anything about this kingdom and its relationship with the British Empire. Mm-hmm. Sure. Um, yeah, that scene in Black Panther, I think, is really iconic. I, it's funny, actually, I read somewhere that the director uh, tried to get the British Museum to allow them to do filming in the British Museum, and they, the British Museum refused. And so they had to kind of make up this weird composite museum called like the Museum of Great Britain. Um, yeah. But the room in which Killmonger, we first meet the kind of... Um, the villain Killmonger, who's also in some ways a hero, is an ambiguous villain, mm-hmm. um, is made, it, it has bears an unmistakable resemblance to um, the Sainsbury wing of the British Museum, in which are housed the stolen Benin bronzes, which are a set of artifacts, not all of them made of bronze, uh, some of them made of brass, some ivory, some from other materials that represented the loot of the British uh, raid on the Edo Kingdom in 1898, um, it, during which time the British uh, imperial forces destroyed the capital city of the Edo Kingdom and displaced its king. The capital city was one of the kind of wonders of the African world and commented on by European um, traders for hundreds of years prior for its incredible earthen uh, ramparts and and earthworks and uh, the kind of majesty of the kingdom and impressiveness of its public its public works um, so this um, the invasion of the Edo kingdom though came quite almost at the end of the imperial project or at the at the end of a certain phase of the imperial project it's and in some ways it's not the most significant of the British ventures into Africa, but it is in many ways, I think for me especially, very demonstrative because the British went in and destroyed uh, the kingdom and deposed its king in order to secure that its territory for palm oil plantations. Palm oil had a very, very important part in the Edo kingdom and in most West African kingdoms and uh, polities um, for centuries, but Uh, This is late into the 19th century when the British were interested in ensuring that there was this cheap source of fuel, uh, sorry, a cheap source of oil that could be used for industrial lubricants, but also increasingly for soap and candles. And at that time, uh, the manufacture of tinned cans, which were important to empire, um, as well as increasingly uh, processed foods like margarine. What had happened was that uh, thanks to the kind of protagonism of enslaved people themselves, as well as their would-be allies in Europe, uh, the British Empire had been forced to abolish the transatlantic slave trade starting in the early 1800s, uh, although it it would be many decades before it was fully abolished. Um, And this left a merchant class in Liverpool, mostly, who had become vastly wealthy through the triangular trade between um, England, the West African coast, and uh, the Caribbean to search for a new commodity. And they were able, through their trade networks that had been established in the the West African um, slave trade, to very quickly pivot towards the, the export of palm oil to Europe making use of the same kind of course of trading relationships that they'd established for the taking of humans. Uh, and through the 19th century, for the first half of the 19th century, that was mostly just Europeans kind of showing up on ships or starting coastal entrepots and uh, loading palm oil into their ships. But starting in the mid 19th century, European hunger for palm oil um, meant, and other commodities from inside of Africa, meant that Europeans tried increasingly to cut out the African middlemen and move inland and set up plantations and trading factories that could allow them to get even cheaper prices. Uh, And this was also the result of rivalry between different European 
imperial powers between Germany, France, uh, Portugal, Spain, and England. Um, and essentially, by the end of the century, they had met uh, in Berlin at the famous Berlin Conference and carved up uh, M uh, Africa into different chunks. And Britain got the chunk that it would later become to be known as Nigeria. And in that space was the Edo Kingdom. It was one of the last kingdoms that sort of held out against British imperialism because it was so far inland. Um, and inland, it had been difficult for Europeans to access because of malaria and other tropical diseases, but also because it was difficult before that time to move uh, European troops in inland uh, for a whole variety of logistical reasons. New technologies, including the steamship, allowed that. Steamships, I should mention, that were greased by palm oil. Mm. And so for me, the invasion of the Edo Kingdom represents this kind of uh, a key moment where we see something uh, rear its head. And for me, that's not just a moment of kind of imperial butchery where they, you know, go in and, and take what they want and destroy a whole civilization. It's also something a bit even, even darker still. The Edo Kingdom, one of the ways that this was sold and justified to the British public was that this wasn't just about the British Empire supporting a bunch of British capitalists to go in and smash and grab what they wanted. It was claimed not without evidence that the Edo kingdom, the Oba, the king of the, the Edo kingdom, who was kind of a spiritual figure as well as a political figure, uh, was performing acts of human sacrifice. Now, the historical record on this is, um, it, there's a debate. Many historians suggest that the forms of human sacrifice that the Edo kingdom was practicing are probably closer to capital punishment, punishment for crimes. Other people think it was a, you know, a gory religious rite that was inhumane and horrible. There's no justification for either. But this was in any case sort of salaciously embellished in the British press to uh, allow, to then sort of license the British to go in and destroy the kingdom in the name of bringing civilization, Christianity, and commerce. Um, and what I think disappeared from view here, and the, a theme that runs through my whole book, is that ultimately the British, of course, licensed themselves to do this, saying, oh, we need to intervene against human sacrifice. And yet they themselves are an empire of human sacrifice. The destruction of the Edo kingdom was a massive form of human sacrifice. Hundred, thousands of people were murdered in the name of this invasion. Meanwhile, across the ocean, you know, somewhere in the range of a sixth to a fifth of the population of China had become a, a, a dependent on opium, thanks to British exports from India, which was itself suffering massive famines thanks to British uh, agricultural uh, and economic projects. Around the world, there was a whole empire of human sacrifice. And yet somehow the sacrifice that was being performed in the name of empire and capitalist modernity was hidden from view by this fixation on the sort of salacious uh, rumors of African human sacrifice. And so uh, throughout my book, I try and come back to this theme of sacrifice, including into our present age. Yeah, that that was something I was going to bring up. And of course, you pretty well elaborated on it there. But the yeah, the theme that runs through the book that what I was really picking up on, and you state it really clearly in the book as well is is human sacrifice and our how it's used as a way like you just mentioned, uh, you know, as, as a as a pretext for invasion and colonization. Um, but the ways in which human sacrifice are also invisibilized within in order to justify a, a system such as you know whether that be a kind of a colonial system uh, or you know of course capitalism it reminds me i can't help but like draw in some of the uh, discussions around covid too of like mm -hmm. human sacrifice to keep the economy running yes these people were going to die anyway so let's keep it going you know um it feels that um, as things proceed, human sacrifice is implicit or explicit, depending on how, <laughs> on what's, I guess, the, 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 with COVID, it was in everyone's face and is in everyone's face. Mm -hmm. With palm oil, like so many commodities on the global market, it is ubiquitous and yet invisibilized. And so the amount of exploitation and human sacrifice required to produce this product as cheaply as it is produced and sold um, requires enormous amounts of human sacrifice. Um, mm -hmm. 
I don't know if there's a question in there, but I really <laughs> wanted to appreciate that point. Yeah. You know, if you had any more points to elaborate on there regarding um, how human sacrifice is, mm. is used mm. both as a weapon and, and also as something that's just um, obscured. Yeah. 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 I mean, I think about it so much and I wanted to avoid in this book, just saying, you know, capitalism is a system of human sacrifice. Gotcha. Because like, there's not actually that much use in saying that because like, even if we don't call it human sacrifice, capitalism's crimes against people on the planet are so severe and so grave that they don't need hyperbolic embellishment. Um, so I'm not just using the term human sacrifice just to, for the shock value. I really believe there's something interesting at the bottom about this, interesting and terrifying. I mean, yeah, on on one level, if we just zoom out and you look at the planet as if from Mars, you would be hard pressed not to say that humanity is in the grip of a uh, of a violent theology to a cruel god called the market, who demands sacrifices from and you know that that humans should allow each other to die and perish. Um, and, you know, an anthropologist from Mars who looked at the whole sweep of human history and the many different societies that have practiced human sacrifice would probably not find that ours is all that different, except for the fact that in other societies, they at least do the courtesy of, you know, bringing their sacrificial victim up to the top of a ziggurat and cutting out their heart, whereas we just allow people to die. Um you know, or we subject them to circumstances of premature death, as Ruth Wilson Gilmore puts it, uh, through the kind of um, the logics of race and colonialism and neocolonialism and imperialism. Or, you know, we create a world of such scarcity that it triggers wars that murder people uh, indirectly. Um, so in a sense, I wanted to draw our attention to that and suggest you know, that maybe there's more continuity than, than change. And I do this in order to break with um, people who I see as kind of, in some senses, theocrats of the market. There's a strong tendency in neoliberal philosophy to suggest that, that the capitalist economy and the capitalist system is singular in human history because it is the triumph of modernity and the enlightenment. It is the manifestation of a metahuman intelligence for the distribution of goods and services that emerges from competition rather than from the particular political or ideological or religious uh, fixations of a particular person, a particular ruler. And therefore, it allows us to kind of um, transcend violence. And, you know, like someone like Steven Pinker is perhaps, you know, one of the most sophisticated um, proponents of this. But Hayek, Frederick Hayek also makes this point that, you know, ultimately, if markets are let to do what they should do, we will see a diminishment in human violence. Um, and certainly a transcendence of human sacrifice, because in the very narrow modernist interpretation of human sacrifice, it's this sort of atavistic, barbaric, barbaric custom that is just performed by people who are so beguiled by their belief in a false god that they justify their own violence in the name of religious expression. Um, there's other anthropological work that suggests that in any society, sacrifice is always has is somewhat politically expedient. Like human sacrifice is often undertaken, the, the sacrificial victim is often a prisoner of war or a slave or a member of a lower caste. And it serves this function for the rulers of that society to intimidate their underlings who fear that they too might become the sacrificial victims. But something else very important begins to emerge too from that anthropological literature, which is that in many of those societies, the human sacrifice, you know, it, our temptation today is to look back on the sacrificial actions of the Edo kingdom or the Aztecs and say, oh, well, this was just a kind of elite of priest kings who terrified their people into submission. There's something else, though, that I think is more important for us to focus on, which is that if we actually probably went back and asked these people, like, why do you do it? They would probably say one of two things. One of them was they would say, well, oh, well, the person we sacrificed was not actually a human. So it's not human sacrifice. They're they're a different mm -hmm. group. You know, mm -hmm. they're they're subhumans somehow. They're from that other tribe over there or they're from, you know, they, they've been selected by the gods to be sacrificed as sort of a subhuman character. But the other thing that they would say most likely is, look, you know, like, it's horrible. We admit it's horrible. We don't like cutting, you know, doing this horrible stuff. But look, if we didn't do this, then the gods would starve or the gods would be displeased. And that would unleash incredible terrors and calamity on the whole population. So sure, it's pretty, you, you can complain that it's pretty bad that, you know, this person got their heart cut out. 
but would you rather that there were a hurricane that killed hundreds of thousands of people and possibly destroyed our whole civilization? Right. You know? And I think there's something very similar that happens in the logic of the market. Like if you go to someone today and you say like, uh, you know, in the palm oil industry, for instance, and say like, why do you have to abuse workers and chop down rainforests? They would say, look, um, we don't like to do that. First of all, we have no control over it because it's all of these subcontractors and sub sub subcontractors who are operating right. out in the jungle. We have no control over. And why don't you go hassle the government who should be policing it, not the industry? But the other thing they would say is, look, you know, this is the market doing its work. Uh, this is the benevolent providential market. And, you know, you do-gooders who are telling us to, you know, pay everyone a living wage and respect orangutans, what you don't realize is that the market will take care of this eventually. And the market kind of knows best. Um, if we were to intervene and jeopardize the free market, we would actually on a global scale be jeopardizing a source of wealth, peace, uh, m progress. So, and we would be throwing ourselves backward into a state of barbarism. In order for that cosmology to work, that cosmology of capitalism, we need to retain this idea that these other civilizations were somehow more barbaric and more terrible than ours. Sure, all civilizations have their problems. Human sacrifice is never acceptable anywhere. But somehow imagining that we're not a society that performs human sacrifice allows us to invisibilize the fact that this sacrifice is happening in plain sight. And if it's allowed to happen to the people in the palm oil industry that in Act 1, then in Act 3, it will be allowed to happen to all sorts of people, all sorts of vulnerabilized people in the pandemic. The final thing I would say about it is like uh, one of the big theoretical presences that haunts this book is that of Georges Bataille, the, the radical French theorist who was, a, you know, tried to rebuild an entire political economic theory uh, on the notion of sacrifice and on the notion of abundance. And very briefly, his argument is that, you know, like every society necessarily is a sacrificial society because the problem that societies face is not, as we've been told by economists, scarcity that there's scarce resources that we need to fight over. The problem for every society is that there's too much energy, there's too much abundance, and every society has its methods of getting rid of that abundance. But some of those methods are more peaceful than others. So typically in, in indigenous societies, there are sacrificial customs. There are ways of honoring the gods. There's ways of giving thanks that don't descend into ritualistic murder. But to the extent that societies deny that there are that there is this fundamental abundance in this you know, beautiful world we share, and an abundance of human creativity and ingenuity and cooperative power, you get these strange moments where societies that become obsessed with scarcity also become the ones that are performing the most heinous uh, and, and bloody acts of sacrifice. Somehow, there's a strange irony there that he tries to understand in his alternative political economy. And I think it's well worth us continuing to dwell with that, that societies like ours that deny they are sacrificial are in some ways the most sacrificial, but that that is something that can never be admitted or accepted. Mm -hmm.